like I think I got a booger or something. Like, but that day was very uh, joyful for me. It was a bunch of joy in that in that day. Same thing happens in this in, the, in this verse that we're reading. There's a wedding going on. They're full of joy. They're having a good time. They're drinking the wine, and all of a sudden, the ladle's empty. The ladle's dry. Where's the wine? And everybody starts to panic. Oh, my God, there's no more wine. There's no more wine. Jesus says, fine. Go check that. Go check the other one, the one with the water. Go fill them up. And there's wine in there. And everybody, we know the story. Everyone starts talking about, oh, man, why'd you save the best for the last? Usually the best is first. So we, go, we get into that. But when Jesus was at this wedding, he was there. At this, he, his presence, Jesus' presence was there at the wedding when this happened. Okay? He was there. The, 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 the wine being gone meant that the joy for that marriage was gone. But Jesus being there, turning that water into wine, meant that the joy was going to continue. So with that in our understanding, now we don't look particularly at the miracle or the sign in the gospel, but rather at the significant of the saying of that gospel by our Lord. Do we see that? So we don't longer look at, oh, water to wine, but we look at the fact that it meant that the joy was reestablished, but it was reestablished only because Jesus was present. Now let's talk about the needs of Jesus in a person's life for getting to live a life of wonder. That was, actually, that was actually a good transition. I like that. Pastor Jose murders it on these outlines. So let's look at Jesus' presence in our life in order for us to live that abundant life, that life in abundance that he so desires for us. Throughout this series, this series, we've learned that an abundant life is the same or includes eternal life. Knowing this is, is how we can best understand and learn from the following passage. So when we understand that Jesus in our life and what he wants for us and the life abundant, which also includes eternal life, we'll be able to better understand this next verse. Now, now this, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Jesus here is praying to the Father, in, and in his prayer, Jesus is stating that he had finished the work the Father had him to do on earth. <clears throat> let's, look at, let's take a look at John 4.34. Jesus said to them, my, my food is to do the, the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Across the gospel of John, there is an emphasis on Jesus doing the will of the Father. For Jesus, uh, for Jesus his whole purpose on earth was to do and complete God the Father's work. It was Jesus' main purpose. It was his work, his desire 
to come and fulfill this work for the Father. And to do it, not partially, fully, complete. To the point of a death on a cross. Let's take a look at John 5.36. But I have a testimony greater than John's. The works that the Father has given to me to complete, the very works that I am doing, testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. So as we can see, there is an emphasis on, an emphasis on not just doing the work of the Father, but to complete his work. So that is why we can understand why the prayer states this very important fact about Jesus' complete works. If Jesus would not have completed this work, his death would have been in vain. That death was necessary. And we're going to get into that. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Because he was a perfect man. And he he died a, a brutal death. A death on the cross. But because of that sacrificial death, that work for the redemption of our lives, our souls, was necessary. Jesus' Jesus completed work enables the following. It enables us that people would get to know the true God through Jesus. We want, to, we want to know the true God. We want to know the almighty God. We want to know the creator of this universe, the creator of everything in existence. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty awesome, actually. I always marvel when I look at the stars and I look at the sun and I look at the moon. Just because I can't go any further than that in my own, with my own eyesight. I can't, I, man, I can't read the clock if I take my glasses off. But when I have them on, I try to get a good glimpse at what's going on. And I can see the creation. And I can see that his creations declare his glory. You know, I, I love in the, in the book of Job, man. I love it. I'm, I'm going to Job only because we're, I'm, I'm on this topic. I love that he says, like, hey, Job, where were you when I hung the stars in the sky? You know, I put every single star right where it's supposed to be, and guess what? I named them all. I gave them all a name. I can say, I I feel pretty confident saying this, that every single one of us here, we were all in his thoughts before the foundations were even created. So just as those stars were put out there and he named them all, same thing for each and every single one of us. He put us down here. He created us, fearfully and wonderfully made. And he named each and every single one of us. So not only are the heavens something that's awesomely created and marvelous and and we can declare his glory, let me tell you something real quick since I'm on this. You also declare his glory because you are fearfully and wonderfully, wonderfully made. You were created. And that's just awesome to even think about. Jesus' complete work was so that we would get to know the true God, the almighty God. Through him. And so that through him, people would get to live a life abundant. When anyone gets to know the true God through Jesus, that is to receive the gospel of Jesus, 
that person receives eternal life. When we heard the gospel for the first time, and we said, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, it was at that moment that eternal life had come to you, that Jesus himself had come to you. Having life eternal, having eternal life, means that living life abundantly after coming to Christ and getting to know God on a personal level. How many of us would, if we don't already know God on a personal level, how many of us would want to know God on a personal level? And if we do know him on a personal level, how much more do we want to know about him? How much more do we want to understand his purposes for our life? How much more do we want to understand the, the, the goodness, the richness that he has in store for us? Because we, we only know what we have right now. But I believe that God wants us to live that life abundant. That life with that... In, in, in every aspect of the term, in every form of the term. When we come to Christ, we, we begin to have that eternal life. We begin to live abundantly. And when we, we come to Christ, we begin to establish that relationship where we can continue to grow and know God himself, the creator of everything on a personal level. Jesus' life on, in this world was lived perfectly. And his perfectness among all who were uh, imperfect enables those with a sincere heart for God to know God through Jesus Christ, the perfect man. I was talking about it earlier. Jesus was perfect. And he came to be amongst us who were imperfect. How many, let me ask this. How many of us have Christ in our life? You don't have to show hands, but if you want to, you can. How many of us have accepted Christ? How many of us that have accepted Christ live perfect lives? But Christ was perfect. Jesus was perfect. And he came knowing that we couldn't be perfect. But so that if we open up our hearts sincerely to God, to Jesus, that he would come in and that perfectness would make his perfectness, his righteousness would make us righteous so that we can have that relationship with the God, with the mighty God, a living God. So the complete work of Jesus, the, so the completed work of Jesus for the Father includes having lived a perfect life as a human being and as a perfect human being being sacrificed on the cross for everyone else's sin. A perfect man, think about this. Someone without fault, without guilt, sentenced to death. For you and I, this man, Jesus, he could have called an army of angels to set him free. Matter of fact, Scripture tells us that everything and anything that was ever created was created by him, for him, and only through him. 
So what is it that he couldn't have done to come off that cross? <laughs> he could have done it. But you know what? He was sent on a mission. He was sent on a mission. And that mission was to complete the will of the Father. And in that completion, his life was at stake. And he said, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to take those nails to get pierced. I'm willing to take that thorn, that crown of thorns on my head. I'm willing to get spat on. I'm willing to get my, my side pierced. I'm willing to get whipped and lashed, get smacked. I'm willing. Perfect. Perfect. He was perfect. And yet he died and he did it out of love so that we can have that relationship with the Father. He died for our sins, ladies and gentlemen. So being able to use the gifts that we have for others to be blessed and truly help others is possible when we know when we know God in this way because it's foundation is God's love. Its foundation is God's love. Let's take a look at this next verse. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Knowing God in the person of Jesus Christ means having a personal relationship with God through Jesus on an everyday basis. If we don't know God, we can't love. It's actually kind of brutal. Love is, God is love. So if we don't have God, we don't have that love to give. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. But before that, it says, because love is from God, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, knows how to love, knows love. Knowing God in the person of Jesus Christ means having a personal relationship with God through Jesus on an everyday basis. And this takes us on to the next, uh, to the next need we have towards a life and a life abundant, which is the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. The foundational reason why we as believers can live a life abundant is by having healthy relationships, having the desire to grow and the desire to be a part of something greater than oneself, and it's all because the Holy Spirit is in us. You know, I always think about that. Being a part of something that's greater than oneself. <clears throat> I tell you what, man. <clears throat> I'm humbled to be up here. This is humbling. <laughs> Never in my life did I ever think that I would be sharing God's word. So to be a part of something that's greater than myself is awesome because I'm doing it for someone who is greater than anything else, than all else. But it's humbling to be a part of something like this. But to be a part of something like this, it's a blessing to my life. It blesses me. <clears throat> the 
we read here that Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. But let's consider something. That when we read the Gospels, according to the Gospel of John, this happened after his de- resurrection. So this is even, this is, this is interesting. Because you have a perfect man being crucified, put to death. Put in the tomb. Three days, he's gone. We know that because the women came to go get his body, prep his body, you know, and you got a dude kind of chilling on the rock. Like, hey, why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? <laughs> why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? Wait a minute, he died, right? But he's living. Jesus had said, that after his death, he said, hey, he breathed, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit, but he's dead, but he's given life. It is the Holy Spirit who is still working on earth in this church that enables believers to do what it is takes to live a life abundant. That same breath that he gave them that day where he said, receive the Holy Spirit is the same breath that he tells us today that says, receive the Holy Spirit. And it's that Holy Spirit, it's that breath of life, that breath of from God that allows us to live that abundant life. I want to note something, and I want you guys to really carefully take notice of this. Jesus is needed towards life, and a life abundant, not religion. Not talking about religion, we're talking about Jesus. The church is the body of believers in Christ, but not necessarily an organized religious organization. But if there are going to be organized Christian religious organizations, It ought to be an enabler of people getting to know God through Jesus Christ. Notice again carefully. It is the Holy Spirit that that enables the believer to accomplish all the needs towards a life and a life abundant. It's not about the church, man. But if the church allows you, encourages you, and helps you, to receive that gift of Jesus, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, then let's do it. Let's preach Jesus Christ. Let's share Jesus Christ. Because it's only him and and the Holy Spirit that will give us that life in in abundance. I'm going to ask you guys, Who here needs Jesus? Who here needs the Holy Spirit? It's a question for you guys to think about right now. And while you guys are thinking about it, this doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have him. Or it doesn't mean that if you have him, you don't need him. Because I have Jesus and I want more. This doesn't mean, when I say who needs the Holy Spirit, it doesn't mean that you don't have it because if you have him, but if you want more of the Holy Spirit, that's the question that we should be answering. 
I'm going to ask you guys to take a stand. And if you have a need for Jesus or an extra dose of his Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you to come to the altar. We have men and we have women prepared to pray over you, to minister you. Lord, we want to thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the word of life and life abundant that you have given us. We pray that the, the hunger that we have, that the need that we have for more of you, Father, increases every single day. We pray that your Holy Spirit continue to fill our lives, continue to overwhelm us, continue to, to minister us, continue to, to heal us, continue to just do its perfect work in our lives. Lord, we all need you. We all need more of you. And we want to drench ourselves in you, Jesus. We want to be saturated by your Holy Spirit. And I want to th thank you because when we're willing to, to ask, you're willing to give. The scripture tells us that if we would only ask, if we would only seek, that you would give. And we thank you for, for that promise. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord that this word continues to, to, to be, to continue to grow in the hearts of every single life here. We declare a blessing upon them, and we declare, Father God, that your word, that your Holy Spirit, Father, will continue to minister them, that will continue to, to encourage them throughout the rest of the day today. I thank you for each and every single one of the lives and I thank you because it is you that brought him here. Lord, we, we put this service in your hands. And we declare that your work was completed according to your will. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for everything that you've done today. Amen.